OK. So in this lecture, we're going to keep going with what we had um, talked about before, which is looking at the dorsal gradient, but also, in particular, um, how does it specify genes past a certain location? Um, last time we talked about it, we said the, the, maybe the width changes over time. It didn't, right? We did some live imaging. We showed that it, that it didn't happen. Um, and then we ended with this idea, this sort of intriguing idea, which is the, the transition widths, as we know from, uh, from general morphogen gradients, transition widths increase further away from the morphogen peak, right? So the further away you get from, like, the, the top of the morphogen gradient, the, the, the larger the transition widths you get. And that's what's expected, uh, maybe we should say for exponential morphogens. Morphogens that are distributed in space as e to the negative x over lambda, right? But it's going to be worse for dorsal, because dorsal is not exponentially distributed. It's e to the minus x squared distributed. So it's going to be worse for dorsal. All right, so let's ch take a look at um, these type 1, 2, and 3 expression boundaries. So the type 1 expression boundary, you have this delta x, this transition width, which is actually pretty narrow. The type 2 gene expression boundary, um, it's a little bit harder to uh, depict here. Uh, I'm going to draw it down here. You have a delta x for the type 2 gene expression boundary, which is wider than the one for the type 1 gene expression boundary. And I'm kind of just eyeballing these, right? I don't have any, like, exact points that I'm, I'm using to determine what's delta x and what's not. And then for the type 3, it's worse. Right? For, the, for the type 3, um, the gene expression, or the transition width is so large that I can actually draw my delta x in between the two lines. And then finally, for the type 3 minus, that was a type 3 plus, for the type 3 minus, it's even worse, where delta x is even huger. And that's, what, that's what's experimentally observed, right? So I'm not talking about any sort of, like, theory or modeling or anything like that. I'm just looking at the gene expression boundaries for these type uh, 1, 2, and 3 domain domains of gene expression. The other thing to note, and I don't remember exactly how much of this we've talked about in here. So if this is review, then it's review, okay? But you have the dorsal gradient here, and you have, uh, this is a, um, uh, an antibody staining against dorsal in fixed embryos. So you have high, con you can see the high fluorescence here on the ventral side of the embryo because dorsal is highly concentrated in the nuclei down there. Um, the reason why it is in the nuclei down there, if I look at this region of the embryo and I zoom in on what's actually going on molecularly, what you have is, so here's the embryo plasma membrane. This is the plasma membrane. This is the, the border between embryo and not embryo, right? So everything that's outside here is outside the embryo, but it's still confined within the egg shell. Right, so the embryo is inside the eggshell, and so you have the space in between the embryo's membrane and the eggshell. Um, it's actually, there's another membrane called the vitellin membrane. That's, so we're talking about the space between these two membranes. And so you can have signaling that takes place in, outside the embryo, but still confined inside uh, the eggshell. And um, one of those signaling molecules is a ligand for a receptor called toll. Now, in the absence of toll signaling, dorsal is usually bound to its inhibitor cactus, right? So dorsal and cactus are bound together. They're stuck together in the cytoplasm. Cactus is uh, keeping dorsal out of the cytoplasm, so they say. And when you have toll signaling, however, cactus gets forcibly degraded off of dorsal, and then so dorsal is free to go into the nucleus and regulate target gene expression. So because we have all this toll signaling on the ventral side of the embryo, that's why we have dorsal concentration in the nuclei on the ventral side of the embryo. Okay, so that's the other thing, sort of review, or, you know, if we hadn't heard that before, then good to know, right? Okay, so, um, but back to the discussion of transition width, right? So we have transition widths, which are, get worse as you go further away from the ventral midline. Uh, 
Um, that's what's expected generally for morphogen gradients, but it's worse for dorsal because dorsal is not exponential. Okay, it's it just I mean, you could imagine having something that's not exponential that wouldn't do this at all. That would be better. But in dorsal's case, it's actually worse. Okay. All right, but even though, even with this realization that, hey, this transition width here for type 3 genes is larger, the dorsal gradient still isn't good enough for even a large transition width. Okay? Um, right, so our, our measurements of dorsal venous in particular uh, suggest that it does not have enough positional information to account even for the large transition width. Right? So this is measurements of dorsal venous, but it's also measurements of all those fixed embryo cross-sections that we talked about last time. Um, okay, so to see this, um, what we're going to do here is we're going to run a model of gene expression using the dorsal venous measurements as input. So we're still talking about that same paper that we were finished up with last time where we, we actually measured dorsal, the dorsal gradient. Okay, and so in this, in this paper, we, we put together a model of gene expression. All right, so um, for an mRNA, M, we can put together a model of gene expression that looks like the following. So you have the time scale tau times dm dt is equal to some production function, h, which is a function of dorsal minus a threshold theta minus first order degradation m. Right, so this is scaled, um, as you can see, because you have a time scale out here. You don't have any coefficient activating the, um, multiplying the activating function here, and you don't have a first order degradation rate constant here. So this is scaled to fall between zero and one. Um, the heavy side, or sorry, this, this activation function, capital H, is what's known as the heavy side function. So the heavy side function looks like this. So I should say heavy side of Z, or Z is just some dummy variable, right? So heavy side of Z, you have um, zero for Z less than zero and one for z greater than one, for z greater than zero. And so that's what the heavy side function looks like. And so when its argument is the value of dorsal minus theta, then as long as dorsal is above this threshold, then you have turned on your gene. And if dorsal is below that threshold, then you have not turned on your gene. Now, we chose the heavy side function here because this is the best you can get. Um, this is the most on-off you can possibly get with gene expression. Of course, gene expression is not usually exactly on-off, right? There are some intermediate values of, of dorsal that are kind of near the threshold that will give you intermediate values of turning on the gene, right? So it's either, it's not 100% on and then all of a sudden 100% off, right? There's some intermediate values. But we chose this because we wanted to exaggerate the, um, the, the activation function and show that even with as good of a highly precise activation function as you could possibly get, you still can't get good type 3 gene expression domains. Okay, so we took our dorsal venous measurements as input. So, it, so this is what the dorsal venous measurement looks like with this coordinate being uh, in space and then this other coordinate being in time. You can see the sawtooth pattern for the amplitude um, as we saw here when we're just looking at time. Um, and also, the, in space, it's varying kind of like this, this sort of uh, Gaussian-like curve, okay? And we took these dorsal venous measurements, we added noise to them. And the reason why we added noise is because without noise, you could make any pattern you wanted. But we're talking about the question of precision. Do the cells have enough um, ability to read the dorsal gradient precisely enough so that they can place boundaries far away from the ventral midline? If their cells could, if we didn't add noise, which essentially is saying the cells can read the dorsal gradient exactly perfectly, then any gradient, no matter how shallow it is, can place any boundary anywhere. Okay, so we had to add noise. Okay, and so what we, what we found when we uh, ran these simulations um, is that uh, for SOG, which is in green, if the, the threshold that we chose, if theta that we chose was too small, meaning um, even low levels can activate SOG, then expression of SOG went all the way 
to the dorsal midline. It went all the way to the DV coordinate of 1. And I like to refer to that uh, artifact of, of SOG expression going all the way to DV coordinate of 1. I refer to that as the Godzilla tail. And so that's not what we see experimentally. But with our dorsal Venus measurements acting as input to this model, then we can't actually get SOG expression to not be all the way out there. Okay, well, if theta was too small, right? So if the threshold was too small. So what do you do if you want to get rid of this tail? You, you kick up the threshold and you say, well, look, maybe, maybe low levels of dorsal don't activate SOG. Or low levels still, but maybe not quite that low, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to increase theta. Um, so if theta slightly larger to try to get rid of the Godzilla tail, then SOG expression pattern collapses to a type 3, sorry, a type 2 gene expression pattern like V and D. Okay, so if, if I want to have a, a SOG ventral boundary at this location, then I have to have this Godzilla tail going all the way to the, to the dorsal midline. Because the dorsal gradient has such poor positional information out here, where it's supposed to be placed in this boundary, that if you want any expression here, at this location, you're going to also have expression out here. Because there's just no, there's no way for the cells to distinguish themselves between this location and that location. Okay. Furthermore, I'm going to erase this one. Furthermore, even with, uh, and this is, by the way, I forgot to say this, but this is, um, this is nuclear cycle 14 gene expression. Okay. So even with, um, with a type 2 domain, like V and D, even V and D has one too. One meaning a Godzilla-like tail, right? So V and D even is being expressed all the way to the dorsal midline. If I want to even place a boundary here, it, there was enough noise in the system that we started to get all this uh, activation out here. So even cells out here are having a hard time distinguishing themselves from even further up the gradient, right? So <clears throat> what, this, what these simulations show is that the, the, the dorsal venous measurements that we made, they can't be telling the whole story of gene expression. Something else must be going on here. Um, possibly it could be some other relay mechanism, as was suggested last time. Um, I don't think that's what's happening, although that could be happening for some genes, just not the ones illustrated here. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's um, dive a little bit more into this uh, problem of the transition width, okay? Um, as I said, again, above, looking at here, experimentally observed transition widths get worse as you go further away from the ventral midline. If I take my dorsal venous measurements, what do these transition widths, what are they predicted to be? Okay, so let's check it out. So the dorsal gradient um, empirically looks more like this. So your concentration of dorsal is a function of x. It's approximately equal to a, some uh, coefficient a, e to the negative x squared over 2 sigma squared plus b. And we found out um, last time is that there's some sort of like this outer slope, some, some slope to the gradient tail. It's a weak slope, but it's, out, but it's there. So I'm going to say minus m times x. Or it's actually the absolute value of x if you want, but that's fine. Okay. Now if we look at our measurements of the dorsal gradient, we see that a is approximately equal to 60 molecules per micron cubed. B is approximately 27 molecules per micron cubed. And actually, these exact values of molecules per micron cubed, maybe they're up or down a little bit. Um, but the important thing is the ratio of these. right? So B is roughly half of A. And furthermore, this M is approximately equal to 6 molecules per micron cubed. Okay. For, for x in relative units. Right, so if x is dimensionless, then multiplying x onto m gives you the same units as b, but x is dimensionless, so m and b have the same units. 
And of course, we have already seen also that the dorsal gradient width is about 0 0.15, again, in relative units of space. Okay, so keep these numbers in mind. So these are the numbers that, that pretty, do a pretty good job of fitting what we measured for the dorsal gradient to be at, at, a, at a nice little snapshot of, of nuclear cycle 14. All right, so let's go ahead and, and plug in these numbers um, into our transition width formula. So our transition width formula was equal to lambda times alpha naught times the square root of C naught over C. And alpha naught was about equal to 0 0.11. I think in the other lecture I said 0 0.09. Um, it's kind of right in this range, right? And C naught is equal to A plus B, which is equal to 87. And lambda, I mean, if, if, the, if the dorsal gradient was exponentially distributed, then lambda is the, the fitting constant for how it's exponentially distributed. But that's not actually true for the dorsal gradient. And we saw in a previous lecture then that lambda is equal to, at least locally, is equal to f of x over the slope f prime of x, uh, the absolute value of the slope. Right, so that's, that's instead of one lambda describing the entire length scale of the entire gradient, there, you have to worry about a local length scale here. Right? And I mentioned that uh, a couple lectures ago. Okay, so for dorsal, then, for dorsal, what we have is lambda is equal to that C of X that I was showing above. Um, let me scroll that back up to the top of the screen. Uh, divided by the absolute value of DC DX. Okay, so I take this function up here and plug in the numbers. Um, I plug in C of X here. I divide by the slope, so I take the, the derivative of this and put that in the denominator, and then I can calculate what is my transition width. Um, actually, I think this here is my, um, my lambda, right? So normalized length scale lambda uh, as a function of X. It's the normalized length scale as we saw before. It dips down in this range that we want it to be Remember, kind of in a, in a narrow domain on the x-axis, right, between 0 0.1 and 0 0.3. And then after that, it's like the, length, the local length scale gets huge, right? And that's because you have this, this slope that's very shallow, so the local length scale is very large. Okay, so if I have this value for lambda, and I plug that into the transition width equation, and also plug in C of x into this... Uh, this term in the square root. Then I have my transition width, delta x, looking like this blue curve here, right? So the blue curve is our transition width. Coming from our measurements from the papers that we, we, we talked about last time. And these are high, right? I mean, they're, they're clearly large, right? So you have a high transition width for most of the, um, the, the x-axis. So if I look at right at where the type 1 um, gene expression domains are, let me draw it in a different color so you can see that better. Uh, the transition width right at the type 1 gene expression boundary, that ends up being two cells. The transition width right at the type 3 gene expression boundary, sorry, type 2, that ends up being six cells. And the transition width at the type 3 gene expression boundary is right about here, is, if I could draw a straight vertical line, it's basically greater than 20 cells. So the way that trans translates into error bars for like, hey, let's try to place a boundary here. Um, the type 1 gene expression boundary is about here, and translate that into horizontal error bars, you get uh, 1 to 2 cells there at the type uh, 3 gene expression boundary, 2, sorry, type 2 gene expression boundary, 
you have a two to four cell error bar. And at this gene expression boundary, which is type three, you get this kind of error bar, which is six to 20 cells. So it's huge, right? I mean, that's why we're getting this Godzilla tail, right? And even with enough noise, even this type three gene, sorry, type two gene expression boundary, you're still getting some noise way out all the way to the, to the dorsal midline. Okay. Um, all right, so what do we do about this, right? I mean, it's clearly what this means is our measurements are, are off in some way, or they're not predictive. They're not, there's something missing from this scenario, right? So what we wanted to do with that is we took um, uh, the dorsal gradient. We know all the interactions, we think we know, all the interactions that are taking place in, um, in the system. And so we're going to write down some differential equations that describe them. Okay, so we formulated a model of the dorsal gradient, and it was based on a previous model, um, which I'll briefly talk about. Okay, so here we have um, a schematic of this model system where you have, you know, the, the nuclei going around the periphery of the embryo. At this stage, you have toll activation domain being on the ventral side. Um, if I zoom in on what's going on, like, in a nuclear cytoplasmic region, you have dorsal and cactus and dorsal cactus complex all interacting with each other in the cytoplasm, and dorsal can go in and out of the nuclei. Um, because of toll signaling, it causes the destruction of the dorsal cactus complex to split apart into dorsal and cactus. Cactus itself, is, of course, it, of course is, is able to be destroyed, um, but also it's synthesized new, anew off of uh, transcripts that are present in the embryo. Okay, so if I were going to write down a set of differential equations that describe uh, these interactions, I'll have like uh, a differential equation for dorsal in the nucleus. You have um, nuclear import-export terms. You have uh, dorsal cactus binding term here. And that's pretty much all that's happening in the nucleus. In the cytoplasm, in addition to that, you, you not only have these terms that you had in the nucleus, but also you have this term, which is um, uh, toll-mediated dorsal cactus dissociation. And this is a function of x because toll signaling is a function of x. And the last thing you have here is what, is what I call exchange terms. So what are these exchange terms? So it turns out, and again, I don't remember if, if I've mentioned this in here before, but it turns out that, uh, at least at the time that we are putting this model together, the conventional thought, um, based on some experiments from a paper back in 2007, was that these, uh, even though this stage of embryogenesis is a syncytium, which means you have 6,000 nuclei all sharing a common cytoplasm, even so, the cytoplasms that are associated to the nuclei are slightly compartmentalized. So dorsal, for example, could freely diffuse in the cytoplasm near its nucleus. But it took a little bit more effort, so to speak, for dorsal to move into a cytoplasm near another nucleus. So we modeled this cytoplasmic compartment here as a well-mixed compartment. So diffusion was, was fast enough that, that there's no concentration gradients within this cytoplasmic compartment. However, because it was a little bit, there were slight barriers to, to free diffusion going from one cytoplasmic island to another, then the, um, it's actually not well mixed going from one cytoplasmic island to another. So there could be a difference in concentration from cytoplasm to cytoplasm. Even though there's no barrier to, to diffusion, there's enough of a barrier, sorry, there's no cell membrane. There's still some barrier to diffusion, so it's slightly slower than regular diffusion. Okay, maybe significantly slower. Okay, so we, we modeled these as ODEs. So this is an ordinary differential equation describing dorsal in this particular nucleus. I guess I should say dorsal in nucleus H, right, and label a superscript H for each one of these. Um, right, so this is nucleus H. That's the index, and you have, sorry, that's cytoplasm H. Right here, 
cytoplasm H, and then the nucleus associated that with that is nucleus H. Um, so these exchange terms, what they look like, they have some coefficient, which was called gamma, times the concentration of dorsal, dorsal in the cytoplasm of uh, compartment I minus 1 minus 2 times the concentration of dorsal in the cytoplasm of cytoplasm I plus the concentration of dorsal in cytoplasm I plus 1. So this looks like a discretized second derivative. So it looks like diffusion. But even though it looks like it, technically it's not. It's really slow exchange between two well-mixed compartments that are next to each other. But if you think about the way you discretize space in diffusion, that actually ends up being what that is anyway. Okay, so it, that's why it looks like it. And we want to fit this model to the dorsal venous data to see what we get. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, I'm going to switch over to this PowerPoint. Because I want to, this is the same uh, looking slide. The, there are actually four equations going on here, two that I didn't mention. So you have your equation for dorsal in the nucleus of uh, nucleus H, equation for dorsal in the cytoplasm of cytoplasm H. You have your equation for dorsal cactus complex in the cytoplasm. And the equation for the concentration of cactus in cytoplasm, right? So you have these four equations, right? For each one of these four species that you see here. Okay. Um, in addition to that, uh, excuse me. Weird. Okay. In addition to that, um, we are modeling uh, the development of the... Why? Why does it have to be this way? We're modeling the development of the dorsal gradient. I'm just going to like move this around a little bit. Uh, never mind the way my arrow is moving. Um, we are <laughs> modeling the dorsal gradient from nuclear cycle to nuclear cycle. So it starts at nuclear cycle 10, and then nuclear cycle 11, and 12, and 13, and 14. So as, you, as that happens, you have to worry about a couple things. One, what happens to the model equations when you go from nuclear cycle 10 interphase into the mitosis between nuclear cycles 10 and 11? Well, during mitosis, the nuclear envelopes break apart. You don't actually have a, a dorsal gradient anymore. This is absurd. Hello, please stop. I honestly don't know what's going on here. I'm going to try to reset this. Do I want to keep my annotations? No. All right. <clears throat> you don't have the nuclei anymore, so mitosis has to be treated differently from interface. There's no nuclear equation for nuclear dorsal, right? In addition to that, after you exit mitosis, you have, on the surface of the embryo, double the number of nuclei that you had before. Now, because this is a one-dimensional model and not modeling the whole surface, you have square root of two, a factor of square root of two more nuclei on this line than you had before. Okay, and so that's what this, this is supposed to be illustrating over here. Okay, but furthermore, the last thing you have to worry about is um, whenever you, so this is essentially you have nuclear cycles 10 through 14, that's five nuclear cycles, and then you have the four inter, uh, those are interfaces, then you have the four mitoses, right? So you have nine different sort of time domains over which you have to simulate. Uh, you have to run ODE 15S nine different times, basically, which means you need nine different initial conditions. So the initial initial condition at the start of nuclear cycle 10, you could choose that. I don't know if it's arbitrary, but choose it like kind of smartly uh, based on what you think you know about the science. But then the initial condition for nuclear cycle 10 mitosis is dependent on the final condition of nuclear cycle 10 interphase, right? I mean, these, these things have to transition smoothly from one to another so at some level. Like, they have to make sense scientifically. Um, but the, so that's kind of an easy one because the nuclei break apart, and then you just add up all the dorsal molecules in your compartment and then mix them together, right? And so that's your new cytoplasmic concentration for mitosis. But then what happens when, uh, when the nuclei reform at the beginning of interphase? How do you handle that transition to go from something that doesn't have a nucleus, because you only have three variables you're worrying about, to now all of a sudden you have four equations again, 
the fourth, the nuclear equation pops up again. Uh, what do you do for the initial conditions there? Okay, and so this is what um, this is what was used for initial conditions. So you have this mitosis to interface transition. You have um, dorsal, which is in green. Dorsal cactus complex in yellow. I guess there's cactus floating around too, um, but we're not showing you this here. And then at this transition from mitosis to interphase, you have the nuclei form. And then once the nuclei form, then dorsal can go into the nucleus. And that was an important consideration to make. Like, how do we model this? We, we don't really know what, what to do with this. Uh, we don't know what the initial condition of the nuclear concentration is. When the nuclei reform, how do they reform? Do they reform like this, where they kind of grow as a bubble out, kind of pushing everything away? Or is there some other thing that's happening, um, et cetera? So this is the choice that was made for the model that was initially developed, not by my lab. Okay. All right, so that's, that's some considerations. And so we took this um, model, and we tried to fit it to our dorsal venous data. So we just basically took someone else's model, fit it to our dorsal venous data, and it turned out it was bad, right? So the model, I mean, it wasn't totally bad, right? It was a pretty good model, but the model did a decent job with the increasing amplitudes. As we know, these amplitudes are, are having the sawtooth pattern. And um, during, nuclear, during interphase, the amplitude started low and then became high. And at the end of inter interphase, you had the crashing of the amplitude because the nuclei divided, right? So this model, um, it did that, right? So the, it could model the increasing amplitude, which is shown here in purple, overlaid atop of these, like, the kind of more jagged-looking dashed curves, which are the, the, the experimental data. So it did a, a decent job with the increasing amplitudes. But not, that looks like a W, not with the decreasing basal levels. If you look at the model prediction made of the basal levels, which are the concentrations of dorsal in the nuclei on the dorsal side, these basal levels do not decrease. They start low and then go high over interphase, just like the amplitudes did. Okay, and furthermore, both the amplitude and the uh, basal levels, they started at zero at the beginning of each interface. Compare that to the dorsal venous data, which had both the amplitude and the basal levels starting at a non-zero point at the beginning of each interface. Okay, so there's something wrong here, right? But if, you go, if we go back to this um, illustration, oops, if we go back to this illustration of the mitosis to interface transition, you'll see why both the amplitude and the basal levels always started at zero. It's because when the nuclei reformed, they reformed empty. And then once they reformed then, dorsal was allowed to go inside. Okay? And so if I compare that uh, to what's going on here um, in reality, okay, so the model, so let me write this down, right? The model, the model assumed nuclei reformed empty. And that was, I mean, in, in the absence of, you know, any reason to think about it otherwise, maybe that was, hey, let's, this is a default position. Let's just take this, right? But if you think about it long enough, you have to ask yourself, why? slash how would that happen? Like physically, thermodynamically, how would that happen, right? So the one, the one way to, for that to happen is that dorsal, as the nuclear envelope comes together, dorsal would have to be specifically excluded from the nucleus, the nuclear, uh, the nucleus, the nucleus as the nuclear envelope reformed. And, and why would that happen? 
when we say the nuclei reformed empty, we mean empty of dorsal. We don't mean completely empty. There's not like a, a zero pressure vacuum inside the nuclei, right? There has to be at least water in there. And furthermore, if we go back to this, this, this video, <laughs> this silly animation of the nuclei reforming, clearly the nuclei don't form like this either. So they have to encapsulate the, the, gen the genome and all, all of that's in there. So you can't just like have the nucleus grow like a bubble from zero and then suddenly take its, its actual size at the end. It has to reform around the genome. So it's got to be reforming, encapsulating what's already around the genome, including any aqueous solution that's kind of swarming around in there. So the, if the nuclei are reforming devoid of dorsal, that means it, dorsal has to be specifically excluded. Right? So as the, the nuclear envelope's like kind of coming back together, re-piecing itself together, there has to be some sort of like active transport model that's like forcing all the dorsal out. Right? So that would be very costly thermodynamically. And you have to spend all this extra energy just forcing all of the dorsal out, and who knows what else, like picoid two maybe? I don't know. Um, so if you think about that long enough, you need to imagine, well, wait a second, that, that doesn't make the most sense, right, thermodynamically. So why would you make that kind of assumption in the first place? Why, if you're, if you're sitting here busy thinking about, you know, what should our mitosis to interface transition be? Why would you choose this? Why not the nuclei reform and just accidentally capture whatever dorsal is in the cytoplasm? All right, so the dorsal, the nuclear concentration of dorsal at the start of interphase is the same as the cytoplasmic, because you're just kind of like, whatever's in there, you just get it, right? And here's the reason why you don't want to do that. It's because if, the, if dorsal's accidentally being captured by the nuclei, then cactus is too. Because cactus is in the cytoplasm too. Because you have, if, if you want to exclude cactus from the nuclei, right, if the nuclei reform and just accidentally capture dorsal from the cytoplasm, what about cactus? You can't have, um, you can't have it not capture cactus too. Because if you want to say that, then you have the same problem. Cactus would have to be specifically excluded. So again, you have this dorsal, this dorsal, this thermodynamic problem. And it's not just cactus, it's also a dorsal cactus complex, too. Yes. Oh, yes. So, uh, let me scroll back up. I, I did not, um, I, I forgot about that. So there's no actually binding term here in the original model, where there's no cactus in the nucleus. Yeah, that's a good, good, good view here. Uh, this is this was not supposed to be there in the original model, right? But here um, we're realizing. Wait a second, the cactus. So if, if the nucleus is accidentally capturing dorsal, it's got to accidentally capture cactus, unless you really want to spend some energy excluding cactus too. And again, this is a, a thermodynamic problem. Okay, so going back to this assumption, assumption one: cactus is accidentally captured in the nuclei, right? The reason why you want the nuclei to form empty is to avoid this assumption. Because if you have this assumption, that's another, equa another differential equation that you have to write down. So if you want the model to be as simple as possible, to have as few e equations as possible, and still capture you know, behavior that you think might be important for, to model the dorsal gradient, you have to make an assumption that the nuclei form empty. Because if they don't, then there's cactus in there and dorsal cactus complex, and you just added um, two extra equations to your model, right? So now we have six equations, nuclear dorsal, cytoplasmic dorsal, nuclear dorsal cactus complex, cytoplasmic dorsal cactus complex, nuclear cactus, cytoplasmic cactus. So you have two new equations uh, that just arise just by accident because the nucleus accidentally captures dorsal cactus complex and cactus uh, when they reform. Okay, um, and so that's what, um, that's what this uh, slide is showing. At this mitosis to interface transition, um, if it accidentally just captures whatever's in the cytoplasm, then boom, you, you've got a problem. You have dorsal cactus complex in the nucleus. Now, maybe it's only short-lived in the nucleus. Maybe 
the nuclear envelope reform, and then it's sort of exported out, right? That's kind of normal ex expenditure of energy, is to shuttle out things that aren't supposed to be in there. Okay, yes, question. Well, okay, I, I, so I'm not sure. So the question is like, why, why use the word accidentally? Why is it not something that's sort of been finely tuned to, to work in a particular way? Um, it could be. But in the absence of, sh of showing that to be true, I think the default position would be as a nuclei reform, whatever's in the cytoplasm is just inside the reforming nucleus too. And that would be like not necessarily on purpose. Now there could be some purposeful intent, but not in this case. I mean, not in the default assumption. Right? Now it would be awesome if we like had some hypothesis to test to show whether or not that was you know, on purpose or something like that. If it doesn't, like accidentally doesn't, well, we're talking about we're talking about thousands of molecules that are spread evenly over a cytoplasm, and then you have a gigantic chunk of the cytoplasm suddenly being uh, partitioned off, and it would be really unlikely that by fluctuation all of the molecules were at the periphery when the nucleus formed. It, it's yeah, it's not a huge concentration, but it's enough that you would expect some dorsal cactus complex to be in the nucleus when it reforms. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so we've got eight minutes left. And yeah, we, we might be able to get almost all the way through this. Okay. All right, so assumption number one, cactus is accidentally captured by the nuclei. What's interesting is this assumption flew in the face of decades of, of research. Not that there was any particular research to show that cactus could never be in the nucleus. In fact, cactus, uh, for whatever reason, as a molecule is very difficult to image, right? So we can image the dorsal gradient easily. We can tag it with Venus, image it in live embryos. We can do an antibody stain, as we showed. And that's been done like many, many, many times throughout the literature. Um, but cactus has been particularly tricky um, to, to image. And some people have tried it and said, hey, here's the cactus gradient, but it's never been quantified. And there's only been a couple publications on it. And every time that I personally tried it, it hasn't worked. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty hard to nail down. Okay. But anyway, so like I said, decades of research. So, you know, if you look in one of the earliest uh, publications that show, you know, a diagram of what's happening with dorsal and cactus, toll signaling causes dorsal cactus complex to be uh, dissociated. Cactus gets degraded, dorsal goes into the nucleus. Even this um, uh, uh, figure here, which is something that I published in 2009, so this is from 1993. This is the earliest one that we could find in the literature. Even in uh, a review that I published in 1990, uh, sorry, 2009, um, we again have the same thing, toll signaling, dorsal cactus complex, gets, cactus gets destroyed, dorsal goes into the nucleus, right? And so what we're, we're assuming here with our mathematical modeling is that actually you have all three of these species being in the nucleus. Okay, so now that we have equations for all of these, what do we do? Like, how does that change things, right? So um, let's look at the next assumption that we had to make. If dorsal cactus complex is in the nucleus, what that means is that we have to contend with two different fluorescent species in the nucleus. When we're measuring the dorsal venous gradient, we measured specifically the nuclear concentration of dorsal. As, as we mentioned last time. And what, that, what we thought that meant was, this is the dorsal gradient. We don't have to worry about dorsal cactus complex because that's in the cytoplasm. But now, if dorsal cactus complex is in the nucleus too, then all of our dorsal gradient measurements are wrong. I mean, no, I mean, not totally wrong, but <laughs> the problem is that, so you have two different species. You have one that's fluorescent and active. And then you have one that's fluorescent and inactive. So when dorsal is bound to cactus in the nucleus, it can't do its regular job, which is to bind the DNA and turn on target gene expression. Okay, but the, the good side of this is when we took these assumptions, we took our extra different sets of differential equations, and we tried to fit those to the data, the model did a good job, okay, of fitting everything, right? So with these two assumptions, the model fits the data 
qualitatively and quantitatively. So qualitatively means that you could have the basal levels start high and go down. You could have the basal levels and the, the amplitude start at something that's non-zero. And it does actually provide quantitatively a good fit, like the error becomes low if you do uh, uh, parameter optimization on the system. Okay, so you have, you have this scenario where you have these two different fluorescent species in the nucleus. This, um, this here, uh, this surface, which is supposed to be fitting to, scroll back up, to the data represented by this surface. We now know, or we now are thinking, that this represents the total dorsal gradient, which is dorsal plus dorsal cactus complex. Okay, so if I scroll back down. So this fitting surface here that, that was fit to the data, this is two species in the model added together, dorsal and dorsal cactus complex. And what we can do with the model is we can separate those two. And now we can say, now that we have a predictive model, hopefully it's predictive, um, we can plot, well, what does dorsal alone look like, right? So here's total dorsal, here's just free dorsal, and here's dorsal cactus complex, okay? So one thing to note about total dorsal is that you have um, these non-zero basal levels. Free dorsal is that basal levels hit zero, or very close to zero. And also, dorsal cactus complex is basically flat in space. I mean, there's a little bit of dv variation, but there, it's basically flat. And what you can do with this is when we um, deconvolve, that's what we call this, deconvolution, um, when we separated total dorsal into free dorsal and dorsal cactus complex, um, deconvolution is essentially background subtraction. Background subtraction to make the tail of the, of the gradient hit zero at the end, at the end of the gradient. Now, we don't have enough time. We have about one page of lecture notes to go, and so we're going to have to spill this over into next time. Um, but the, the, the kicker about this is that if you, if you separate out dorsal cactus complex from free dorsal, and the free dorsal gradient looks pretty much the same by eye. It's just shifted down. And so what does that mean? Does that help us in any way? And absolutely it does. What it does is it allows the dorsal gradient to actually place gene expression boundaries far away from the ventral midline. It, it really extends the, the range of the dorsal gradient. And you might say, well, how in the world does it, does it do that? It didn't change the slope at all. Right? It's not like there's that much difference between nuclei. Right? You just shifted it down. It's still the same slope. Right? But the relative difference, delta C over C, uh, becomes a lot greater. Okay, And so that actually ends up being what's important. And we'll, we'll tackle that next time. Um, but before I go, I want to... Um, let's see, there was one more thing that I wanted to say here. Oh, yes. So let's scroll back up. Okay, in terms of background subtraction, uh, I, all the way up to here. Okay, background subtraction. Um, this is what the dorsal venous gradient looked like, right? Uh, it, it, just in space, uh, over the different nuclear cycles. The basal levels were significant, right? They're huge. I mean, we've got the basal level of 1,000 compared to the amplitude of, you know, 5,000 or something like that, um, depending on what part of this uh, gra uh, time, time uh, snapshot that you're looking at, okay? And what we're saying here is that these basal levels, everything should be shifted down so that the gradient decays to close to zero, okay? And this will make a big difference uh, with its ability to place these type 3 genes, which we'll, we'll see next time. So um, we, we went through this model of the dorsal gradient, and we found that the model couldn't make sense of the data unless, uh, besides just dorsal going into the nucleus, if you also, unless you also allowed um, dorsal cactus complex and also cactus into the nuclei as well, okay? <clears throat> so when you did that, what you found, 
that if dorsal kinetase complex was in the nucleus, then some of your fluorescence, some of your nuclear fluorescence that you were measuring, came from an inactive species. So we could use the model to fit the data. Then we, we could use the model also to separate the, the model-based prediction into uh, from total dorsal. We separate that into the free dorsal, which is what we care about, and dorsal cactus complex. And the final thing that I left you with was the fact that as we look at, at the model prediction for dorsal cactus complex, it's mostly flat, which means that basically you're taking the total amount of dorsal that you're measuring and you're just moving it down until it hits zero at the tail. So you're not changing anything about the shape of the dorsal gradient, the slope, or anything like that. It's still got the exact same shape, roughly. I mean, there's a little small amount of shape change, right? But roughly, all you're doing is just moving it down until the tail hits zero. And it turns out that when you do that, just that, you actually get a lot more positional information into the system. And so um, that's where we're at. Okay, so this realization had um, uh, this, that kind of impact on the dorsal gradient. So in particular, fluorescence measurements are higher than free dorsal by itself. Maybe I should say they're higher than what you would predict if you could measure just free dorsal fluorescently and not measure dorsal cactus complex by accident with it. Okay? So what that means also is, okay, so roughly, um, since the free dorsal gradient is lower, just kind of shifted downward from what fluorescence measurements are giving you. So then roughly we have C of X. So you still have um, A, E, to the minus X squared over two sigma squared, plus B, plus M, times the absolute value of X, which is that, that slope outside. So I, I wrote this equation down before, and before I said that, you know, um, a was what, like about 60? M was like, I don't, I don't remember, like negative 6 or something like that. But B used to be 27, and now B, which I've indicated now is a little b, to show that it has a smaller value, now B is like about 6, right? Rather than 27. Okay, so if, yeah, so all we're doing is doing a background subtraction um, here. I just took the exact same equation, which was empirical, right? This is not a model prediction. This is just sort of empirically eyeball, eyeballing the shape now and saying, hey, look, it looks roughly Gaussian. Um, by the way, I apologize for the flashing. I don't know what's going on here with this, um, with this screen. Hopefully, it'll work itself out in a second. Okay, um, so all we're doing here is we're taking this empirical model of the dorsal gradient. We're just shifting it down, okay? And the reason why this is 6 is because this is minus 6. Uh, what was it actually really before? Uh, that was negative, um, it was, yeah, negative 6, okay? And so what this means is if B is 6 and this is negative 6, when X equals 1, this term basically disappears, right? Because it's so large that E to the minus X squared, you plug in 1 here and this goes to 0, right? This is 6 and this is negative 6, so it basically exactly goes down to 0, right? That's you know, again, this is just eyeballing, right? But we're, we're playing a game here. We're saying, what, what kind of um, transition width could we expect if we just take the dorsal gradient and background subtract it such that the tail hits zero at the dorsal midline? What, what is it going to look like? And it turns out that you get this really sweet transition width. Before, remember, these transition widths were not very, um, not very good. Uh, so for type 1 genes, it was a little less than 2. Now it's kind of closer to one, not that big of a difference. For type two genes, well, it was six before, now it's closer to two for the transition width. And for type three genes, it was greater than 20 before, 
but now it's closer to like eight, six or eight, something like that. Okay, so with, and, this, and so this red dash curve is with deconvolution. So the transition widths become much more manageable if you can just subtract down the dorsal gradient so that it hits zero at the tails. Now that seemed weird to us at first. I mean, that's what the formula says. You can see the curve right there that was calculated using the formula. But like physically, why does that make sense? Like, why does that happen? Because you're thinking about positional information and we're thinking about what's the difference in, in uh, concentration between two neighboring nuclei. And if all you're doing is background subtracting, you're not changing the slope at all, then the difference in concentration is the same. But what it does is it makes a very a much bigger relative difference. And for some reason, it's the relative difference that mean, that makes that uh, means something. Um, before I get into that and and kind of work through the formula and show you that that's true, at least by the formula, um, let me go ahead and show you what the simulations told us. Okay, so this is another set of simulations of gene expression uh, uh, using the dorsal gradient as input, dorsal gradient plus noise as input. And if you use the total dorsal gradient, which is just the fluorescence measurements, which is what we had used before, uh, again, you get this Godzilla tail for SOG. You can't quite fit um, DPP very well. Um, but for free dorsal, which where we've done the background subtraction, essentially, you get these really nice fits to gene expression profiles. Okay. And part of the reason why is because look at the dynamic range over which the, 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 the dorsal gradient um, adopts uh, from zero, from the ventral midline to the dorsal midline. We have rough, roughly two orders of magnitude that it's spanning over that, that um, frame. Whereas if you're looking at just the total dorsal gradient, because it flattens out at a kind of a high level, you actually don't continue to go down in terms of orders of magnitude. You flatten out here as well. And so you get about not even one order of magnitude here uh, in terms of how much the dorsal gradient is changing uh, from the ventral midline to the dorsal midline. And these order of magnitudes in log space are actually what the cells need to see. Okay, so let's, let's um, write that down. Okay? Oh, I should say this. Uh, wider dynamic range for when you separate out free dorsal. Okay, so in terms of the formula for the transition width, let's, let's unpack this, right? So you have delta x as your transition width, equaling to lambda, alpha naught, which was just a constant, like 0.1, times the square root of c naught over c. Before, we had noted that lambda is the local lambda, so that's c over, um, Actually, let me write alpha naught first, just because that's the coefficient, right? Alpha naught times lambda, which is c over the absolute value of the slope, dc dx, times, again, square root of c naught over c. This can then be written as alpha naught times the square root of c naught times the square root of c over the slope, dc dx, absolute value. Now c naught is the value of the dorsal gradient at x equals zero. And so um, c naught equals a plus b. And c equals a Oops, I should say C equals A uh, EXP of all that junk plus B plus M times absolute value of X. Okay, but also with deconvolution, if you do the background subtraction, C naught is actually a plus little b, right? So with a background subtraction, this value of C naught goes down a lot. Similarly, 
you might have a little b in that concentration as well. And so what you're seeing here is that when you're looking at the transition width, the, the numerator actually goes down, but the denominator, which is the slope, stays the same. And so what that means is that the best delta x occurs when b is minimized. That is, when dorsal, as a function of x, goes to 0 as x goes to 1. And so that's why I chose b equals 6, right? It's like the smallest b can be before you get like negative values of the dorsal gradient. And now looking at the transition widths in like, um, uh, in sort of on the gradient itself, rather than if I scroll up the transition width in this curve is just the transition width versus x. Now the transition width is, is depicted as the actual gradient plus or minus the noise that you might see because of the precision of the reading the gradient. And the total dorsal gradient, like at the type 3 plus boundary, the total dorsal gradient, because it flattens out so high, you have these large error bars that we saw before. But the free dorsal gradient, the noise actually still continues to decline significantly uh, in log space. And so the error bar, even at the type 3 domain, is reasonable. It's reasonable. Right? And it's actually fairly reflective of what you see uh, when we actually measure SOG gene expression patterns uh, experimentally. Okay, so the final question then is, um, which is a little bit more philosophical. It's like the philosophy of science philosophical, right? So maybe it might be an interesting question to think about. So all this was modeling, right? So we took data that had already been published, and we wrote down a model, and we found out the model didn't describe the data very well. It couldn't fit the data. So we added to the model things that we thought were plausible. We just like thought about it. Hey, look, in, uh, at the end of mitosis, the nucleus just captures whatever is in the cytoplasm, right? There's no reason for it to filter out dorsal and cactus um, out of that. So it just captures whatever is in the cytoplasm. So cactus is in the nucleus. Dorsal cactus complex is in the nucleus. And if that's true, then it has this nice implication, which is now the dorsal gradient actually can specify these gene expression profiles uh, that it couldn't before. Okay, So all of that was modeling, and it, it fit the data better. It made a better prediction. or it, uh, The simulated gene expression fit that data better as well. So do we need experimental verification that cactus is the nucleus? Or with just the model and being able to match data with the model, is that enough to say, we think cactus is in the nucleus. Like, how confident should we be that cactus is in the nucleus based on this? Okay, good. So, uh, all right, so here's the um, here's uh, one suggestion. Since we made assumptions, experimental verification would be good. Did you say good, or did you like say crucial or important or? Well, I mean, there's a difference between good, like, oh, that'd be great if we could get that, or like, if you don't get this, we're gonna laugh you out of town. Right? Like, there's a difference. So, anyway, but no, that's a good point, right? Yeah. Okay, so, but if assumption is correct, then you would expect model to match data. And it does. It does in two ways, both in the front end, where it can fit the data that it's supposed to fit to, and in the back end, where it made a prediction about gene expression that matched gene expression profiles, right? Um, However, uh, there could be multiple assumptions that make the model match the data better, right? I could come up with another example where maybe um, instead of cactus being in the nucleus, maybe only a fraction of that dorsal has been activated by toll, right? So toll might have two, um, toll receptor signaling might have two functions. It might cause cactus to be degraded so dorsal can go into the nucleus, but it also directly activates dorsal 
by phosphorylating dorsal, and that makes dorsal active. And so there's an inactive pool of dorsal in the nucleus, which hasn't been phosphorylated. Some of it just makes it in there without getting phosphorylated. And some of it is phosphorylated, and so it's active. And so that is a different assumption that would also potentially match our data. Okay? So there's, okay, so I should write that down. Um, another bullet point here, which is a square now. But other assumptions also match data, maybe. I mean, I haven't done that simulation myself, but it seems plausible what I just said makes sense. Okay, any other points? Yes. Correct, right? So here's a good point. Um, backing up one bullet point, if our assumption is correct, you would expect the model to match the data, but correlation doesn't imply causation. So maybe um, there are, so, th so what you're pointing out here is, is um, both of you, uh, and my, my counterpoint, is sort of the infamous problem called the inverse problem, right? So I have, uh, I have data, and I'm trying to match the model to the data. That doesn't mean the model's right if the model matches the data, basically, right? Uh, that helps. That helps. But what you really need is you need a unique model prediction that comes true, right? Okay, so I'm, unless there's another point that wants to be made, I'm going to wrap this up by saying one last counter, counter, counter point, um, which I'm going to put now in a circle, bullet point. The circle bullet point, but all other models including the first one, the first one that we started out with, where dorsal is the only thing that goes into the nucleus, all other models have assumptions too. So the first model that we had, had the assumption that the nucleus formed empty. I mean, that wasn't even a good assumption, right? So the fact that we made an assumption in our model doesn't put us on lower epistemic footing than the original model. Just because the original model was published first doesn't make it better, right? It had an assumption, and actually, if you think about it, that assumption made less sense than our assumption. So in some, I mean, at some level, you have to, like in science, especially with um, the philosophy of science called um, Popperian falsificationism, the falsificationism idea of science, you have an hypothesis, you don't test your hypothesis, you try to falsify it, right? And once you falsify a hypothesis, you like throw it away forever, but if you find evidence that supports your hypothesis, you still like, well, that doesn't mean anything. It just like didn't falsify it, right? So it's this like kind of a one-way view of progress in science. We, we gather data to falsify things, but if the data matches our hypothesis, that doesn't mean we say our hypothesis is correct, right? Um, so under falsificationism, you have an, a default hypothesis, which is usually called the null hypothesis, right? Just because the first model was published first doesn't mean that's the default. If you think about it, I feel like our assumptions should be the default. Because what could be more default than the nucleus just captures whatever's in it? Whatever's in the cytoplasm as the nucleus forms. That seems like that should be the default. Um, however, even so, um, for a long time, long enough that it has sort of been, quote, established, at least in the thinking of, of a lot of the scientists, cactus is not in the nucleus. So if I want to uh, overturn that idea, even though it's not necessarily, if you think about it long enough, the best hypothesis, that's still a default hypothesis. So you still kind of need evidence to falsify that hypothesis. So it would be nice, in the end, it would be nice to get experimental verification that cactus is in the nucleus. So anyway, okay, so that was just like, you know, some interesting thinking about kind of the philosophy of science. And, it, you know, I ended up with kind of waffling on, I don't know which one's right, but, you know, it, I, I think... I think uh, it would be good because people, you know, when, when we published this model, people didn't like it. They were like, who says cactus is the nucleus? This is just a model, right? So it would be nice if we had some uh, experimental verification.